But right now, uh, to our second uh, feature interview of the morning, and as I explained to you, and probably I was a bit cheeky, I called Winston Peters out uh, last Thursday, I think it was, for not getting an invite to Shane Jones, and I, to, well, to the party, the Shane Jones New Zealand First Party at Shane's Place in Waitangi, which has been a fixture for, I don't know, a few years now. And what do you know, an invite turned up in the mail and then I would have looked like a complete what's-it if I hadn't turned up. So I went up and as I explained to you this morning, I had a great time and woke up on Sunday morning due to the lack of transport infrastructure in Kerikeri, uh, woke up on the Jones couch. Uh, Thank you, Dot and Shane, uh, for hosting me and for what was the most interesting party. And joining us now is the hostess with the mostest last Saturday night, uh, Shane Jones. Shane, welcome to the platform. Nice to talk to you. Greetings, greetings, nice and early in 2023. Yeah, yeah, it was a great do, thank you very much indeed. And Shane, what I loved was, um, there was just all Kiwis. <laughs> well, there was a couch surfer. And <laughs> he, uh, the, the, this couch surfer put new meaning into Shane Jones' expression, get the nefs off the couch. <laughs> <laughs> Um, look, it was uh, look, an incredible coming together right. of people, Shane. Uh, it really was. Yeah, well, that's how we grew up. I grew up north of Kaitaia. No one was particularly wealthy in that little area, and people, you know, they just bumped and grind and got along with each other. They were the uh, grandchildren of the original Dalmatian Croatian gun diggers, the Māori community, the local landowners, who mostly were local Pākehā families. We all worked together. We all had to collaborate, we went to church together, and I think the treaty debate has been driven far too divisively, and it's been based more recently on a false premise that there are two separate ships passing each other that occasionally um, dock together. Uh, this notion of Te Arafiti, which is the bridge, that's the wrong analogy in my view. That Boy, people have been going on, going on about crossing the bridge of late. A whole lot of stuff written this weekend about the bridge. Yeah, all of that, all of that. So, no, it was great to host um, our manuhiri, our, vi- our visitors from afar, the politicians, the media, and our local uh, leaders. Yeah. Sadly, and and your neighbours. Uh, your neighbours are from across the road. They're lovely folks, Shane. They're big platform fans. Or he they is. are, they are. You'd be surprised that uh, there are sources of revenue in the north yet to be tapped by this uh, this, yeah. this challenger to the legacy media. Yeah. The, the other funny thing was, Shane, there were a few diplomats there. I'm not going to say what embassies they were from. And I caught them uh, one stage sort of midway through the evening, I think just after we'd finished dinner. Um, and they were all looking somewhat confused. And I said, it's not quite a Wellington cocktail party, is it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of the recent arrivals. And I think they were getting a, a, a recalibration of a part of New Zealand that we don't see. And Shane, it strikes me, as you've said, that that was so simple and straightforward and the way that I think the vast majority of New Zealanders feel about themselves and each other, yet we have this focus on something which seems by its very nature to be divisive. This, And I hate to say it, the treaty itself is a bone of contention, uh, which is bad for a founding document, isn't it? Absolutely. But it's been captured. It's more recently been captured by a tiny group of academics who seem to think that the United Nations should be used as a platform to run an audit on New Zealand's social, political and cultural relations. I absolutely reject that. To the extent that I'm remotely interested in the United Nations, they should trot off and start dealing with Ukraine and Putin. Yeah. This notion that we've got to live up to a doc, uh, uh, not so much a doctrine, but a document coming out of the UN for the future of New Zealand. The fact that successive governments have agreed life into it, life into it is an absolute joke. We've got to get back to Article 3 of the treaty, which is rights, duties and obligations of all citizens and all members of our community. And don't rabbit, you know, don't rabbit on about rights all the time unless you're prepared to live up to your duties and obligations. And that's where I think New Zealand has drifted away mm. over the last uh, decade or two. And well, Ming Foon was there. I, I had a talk with him and Winston at the same time. Um, but they have released, the Human Rights Commission have re- released a couple of reports which basically say we are full of white supremacist post-colonial race, institutional racism. In fact, the line is it's woven into the very fabric of New Zealand. And Paul Hunt says we need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission 
akin to that held in South Africa after apartheid. What Paul Hunt's going to receive after the election is a pink slip. It'll be high debt after him. That's one thing I do agree with uh, young, young Seymour about. These uh, commissions, they're not actually creating space to grow the country. They're not actually creating space that enable people to be future focused. They're dredging up debates that were had a hell of a long time ago. I don't know the chap, but he does not deserve the job that he has. But you know Ming, Ming and he was at your party. No, 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 I'm just going to say, Ming, I know well. And Ming, I think, uh, did his best work when he was the mayor down in the Tidafiji. But this other chap, this this other chap, you, the name you mentioned, I've never heard of him. Paul Hunt, yeah. And Ming has got a, Ming's got a contribution to make for the growth of New Zealand, but Ming as well knows that writing all that diatribe about two separate uh, societies and the dysfunctionalism uh, created by colonialism is a lot of rubbish. I was, you know, I'll tell you a quick story. I was driving down the road the other day. I saw a whole lot of rubbish, and I thought, I must pick that rubbish up when I come back. I come back, and a local chap who lived in the neighbourhood a young Māori fellow, very well-built rugby league sort of guy. He was picking it up, and I said to him, I said, Ewa, who left this rubbish? Shrugged his shoulders, and he said to me, oh, well, there's a lot of fellows around here who've got that Māori flag flying uh, much to a shame. I don't know why they fly the flag, but they won't get to hop over the fence and pick up the rubbish they dump on the side of the road. Mate, that told me everything. Yeah. There's too much virtue signalling and symbolism, and Ming's got to step well away from that. The other chap, I'm sorry, I don't know the guy, but that report that you've talked about, it uh, distinguishes him who uh, really has no long-term... So no place, uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission, uh, I mean, to me, that's... I, I personally actually, Shane, find that offensive as a New Zealander. Yeah, I was. you've, you've taken the words out of my, my gob. The notion that our race relations, the notion that our entire history should be compared to Johannesburg, whoever the architects of that, number one, they should never have been paid. Number two, they are the viral seeds of distrust and divisiveness. And I'd rather have them out. And I bet you they're the same kind of people that wrote the poor, poor uh, load of uh, rubbish uh, that traces its genealogy back to the United Nations. The The whole shooting box needs to get one massive Chainsaw, chainsaw defenestration experience after the next election. And boy, I've got the gas to do that. All right. Now, Shane, I also want to talk to you today because the Roy Morgan poll out in the last day, and whilst Aye. its timing isn't as contemporary as those two TV polls that came out, it does show, I, I think, perhaps a more realistic indication of where we're at, and it has you guys, New Zealand First, at 5%. So there or thereabouts, and possibly being the Chris Makers, as we now call them, the Chris Makers, um, <laughs> which puts you back in the game, uh, I guess. The Māori Party can rely on one electorate seat, maybe more electorate, Māori electorate seat to get in. You guys, uh, are you? is the strategy to get over five? Oh, yeah, go well beyond five. Mm-hmm. Uh, those who were at Waitangi would have seen that uh, our leader, Winston, is uh, ready for action. It was, I think, uh, deeply symbolic that he was sitting quietly in front of the uh, meeting house and not too far away from the Māori Battalion Museum because he represents, as, as does our party, we represent foundational, traditional values that develop New Zealand. But we all... Very mindful of the fact that the tide goes in and the tide goes out. You can take nothing for granted. But I feel that that particular poll is a more accurate reflection as to how New Zealand first right. is regarded. The other thing, and I'm getting texts about it today, people are asking me, and I think in reality there are a large number of voters, Shane, who look and say, act or New Zealand first. And what's the difference? Mm-hmm. And what is the difference? It's a question I'll just put straight to you. What's the difference between ACT and New Zealand First? Well, let me quickly deal with ACT. Uh, The ACT Party have um, skillfully boosted their identity around the divisiveness of the treaty. But in doing that, they have used quite a lot of sophistication and diverted attention from what the party really represents. The party represents a strong, pro-market, 
anti-government, anti-public perspective on New Zealand society. They've stolen a bit of the rhetoric from Winston. Whereas New Zealand First, we're a nationalist party, we're a patriotic party, and we do um, support the market where it works, but we are not believers in any naive religious sense about some sort of tapu value of the market. The market works in certain areas, but New Zealand was developed by a strong intervening state to maintain infrastructure, boost resilience, and most importantly, look after the security of our citizens. And I think, quite apart from the spitefulness that uh, young David is showing... Oh, come on, maturity. Shane. He turned up there and spoke in Māori. How more respectful can you get on my tangy day? No, what I mean is the fact that when he does talk, for example, about Calvin Davis and he spoke about other politicians, there's always a little bit of spitefulness about him. But he's young. And I understand. I, I made mistakes when I was his age as well. Yeah. Good on him for talking out ill. I really I, I, okay. I admired him, which is why I gave him his genealogy on the Marae. Yeah. Okay. There, and you did, and good on you for that. But we now look at this scenario, and personally I think a likely one, um, that ACT and, and National can't quite get there. Um, mm -hmm. And New Zealand, for, and, and let, let, we know they're joined at the hip one way or the other, however they want to spin it. Um, can New Zealand first be part of or support a national party in government that has also done a deal with ACT? Well, we don't quite know at the moment what the National Party stands for. And I'm, and I'm not avoiding your question. I've heard um, uh, Chris Luxon speak on numerous occasions, and it often comes across as hollow. It comes across as lacking a spine. and It comes across as poll-driven, Shane. No, well, even that in itself, at the end of the day, when people go to vote, they, they're going to want to know, is there any ballast in your walker? Where are you actually taking us? Yeah. What are you going to do? Or are you going to allow yourselves to be driven by the extremities of the ACT Party, who at the end of the day are a very radical party, who uh, want to dismantle so much of what we take as our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, lifestyle? So it's too early to say whether or not New Zealand First uh, would prop anyone up. The most important thing is proved to the voters that we deserve another shot. We deserve first yeah. to be on the parliamentary landscape. All right. Well, well Shane, I'm sorry. I, I don't think there would be anyone interested in voting for you who has not taken the signals in the last two or three months from Winston that you are ruling out putting a Labour government back in power. Yeah, no, no, Winston's laid down, as they say, in the north. He's laid down the Manuka rod, and uh, there's no walking back from right. the fact that uh, we were we were absolutely uh, tricked and deceived by Jacinda and all the things that her and Nanaia Mahuta uh, had brought forward. We genuinely had no idea that Nanaia Mahuta was cooking up a witch's brew of divisiveness and hostility behind the scenes. And the longer she stays out of the country, the better married him will be. Well, that's a pretty strong statement. Well, the truth of the matter is we had absolutely no idea that the creation of sewerage pipes was where the social experiment of co-governance was going to be delivered. Yeah. OK, let's, let, 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 let's bang through that. Co-governance, governance, yes or no? Absolutely not. Co-governance has got nothing to do with the well-being of the garden variety Maori household. The idea never came from Maoridom. This is dreamed up by the bureaucracy and that small bunch of unelected elitists who like to trot off to the UN. Okay. Separate yeah, Maori Health Authority. Yes or no? No, no, no. There, there, there's, there is no purpose for creating a Wellington-based Maori bureaucracy where you don't have Maori professionals, you have professional Maoris. And I don't like the letter, so it's gone. Well, okay. You're putting your stake in the ground quite clearly. What about Shane Jones? Where does Shane Jones stand? What is his position? And I was sitting there thinking, well, what do I call you? Former New Zealand First MP, are you... Uh, and I know you New Zealand First guys don't get too hung up on titles. Are you deputy leader? Are you spokesperson for this or that or what? <laughs> I'm, uh, when, when I'm uh, announced uh, formally as a candidate uh, for the upcoming election, then you'll have uh, whatever titles you're after, mate, but... Uh, the way in which you've described me is New Zealand First member, 
former minister, Northland identity, I'm mm. cool with that. Yeah. Look, Shane, the other thing that struck me, even just a day in Kerry Kerry, and I, I did a lot of travelling over Christmas to remote parts of the country like the East Cape, um, people aren't necessarily <laughs> talking about Hipuapua or their, you know, the new United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. They're talking about potholes in the roads. They're talking about jobs. They're talking about access to health care. They are talking, strangely enough, about the kind of bread and butter issues that suddenly the Labor Party's woken up to. And they have n nothing to do with anyone's racial identity or anything else, do they? Well, that's why I was so upset when this... Uh the creation of uh, sewerage pipe uh, infrastructure to take away pee and poo became racialized with uh, iwis uh, having some sort of governance role. Not only was it deeply destructive to any sense of uh, status and dignity in embroiling maridom and such a thing, it's got nothing to do with mum and dad getting their kids ready to go to school this morning. It's got nothing to do with a better set of policies for truancy. Does, is the school bus going to be safe on pothole-strewn roads? The fact that the Labour Party has found that particularly uh, strong part of their mission so late in their recent existence is an indictment on all the identity apostles that have ruined that party. Yeah. Shane, um, question here uh, from Ro uh, on the text. Will New Zealand first contest the Māori seats? No, 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 no. No, that's been the policy. We, we certainly look for uh, Māori voters. Uh, sorry, we look for voters on the Māori seats and we are, are always strongly supported at a party vote level within those seats. But for this particular election, um, the board and the strategists of our party have said, no, we won't be standing uh, candidates, but often we do go looking for the party vote in that particular mm. bunch of constituencies. Um. Do you think Chris Hipkins is going to, in, many, in a meaningful way, uh, roll back three waters, stop co-governance, take on his Māori caucus? What do I really think? I think he would... I think deep down he probably wants to, but I don't think he can afford to fracture his broader caucus. And the Māori members of the Labour caucus, many of them... God-fearing ordinary Kiwis have themselves been trapped by their own rhetoric. They can't see a way of backing out of it. But I'll tell you what, unless Chris Hipkins puts the whole thing on ice and goes back to basics and accepts that they've squandered uh, tens of millions of dollars on it, that it's a flawed concept, it's a brilliant weapon which will be used to hammer them every week. Mm. OK, the well, here's another question. And you have been, thank you, unambiguous about... Uh, Winston putting the stake in the ground, uh, uh, laying down the stick and saying, no, we're not going to go with Labour this time. I noticed at your party there were way more Labour MPs there than any other political party, including the Nats or anyone else. And they seem to be having a good time, frankly, Shane. Mind you, everyone was having a good time. And I'm wondering if Chris Hipkins did roll back, if a new Labour party under him moved closer to New Zealand's first, as you've described them, you know, nationalist positions, whether or not you wouldn't say that you were justified in changing your mind and going with them? Well, you know, there's the old term, the pay grade, and I'd advise you to take that question <laughs> to, the, uh, to the master <laughs> of fun and lucky. <laughs> yeah, OK. Look, I get that. Um, and, look, you made an interesting comment, you know, the tide goes out, the tide comes in. I know that uh, from my own career, and I guess people know that uh, from their own lives. It still seems to me that ACT, in a strange way, is your, is your biggest competition here. They can be comfortable that they've got 10 to 12% of the vote, and you guys are sniffing around at the five. Uh, but I really do wonder if they're the guys that you want to have the argument with or not. Yeah, I mean, part of politics often is being defined by who your enemies are. Mm. And I've tried really hard, mate, although I know that some of my rhetoric is, uh, it's inflammatory, that's just the way God made me. But the reality is, 
we are in the north. We're kind of hanging around a similar pond, and I know the people. Yeah. Um, some of them in the ACT Party. And I, I, I personally, when I, when I studied and got my uh, qualifications many years ago, I always took the approach of being hard on the issue and soft on the personality. Yeah. But when someone's hard on my personality, man, my blood boils and I love the fight. But I try to be hard on the issue. And the issue is... We've got, they've got, they've nicked some of our lines and they've nicked some of our issues, certainly in the yeah. area of race relations. But I back myself against anyone else in Parliament with Winston. We will occupy that territory bit by bit. And when we get to the election, people are going to say, you know, we can trust Winston and Jonesy because they're of that background. They've grown up in that world, but they're progressively modern, future orientated nationalists. All right, and, and that, and I've had a number of texts saying, what's the difference between ACT and New Zealand First? And what I'm hearing from you is we might share some ground on issues like co-governance and, and three waters, but we are prepared to have the government intervene to protect and enhance the lives of people, particularly those in Struggle Street who are doing it hard. Yep, many of the people in rural New Zealand, they mm. are in Struggler's Gully. Yeah. And... We're not going to have a resilient nation unless we can deploy the resources of the government to boost our resilience. And I'm sick of all the shrill, in incandescent language about climate change. The reality is we've got to adapt, and we can't adapt unless the Crown inter invests yeah. with the private sector together and boost our resilience. Yeah. The, Act doesn't, the Act Party does not believe in that. Yeah. One other thing, Shane, Cooper, from that neck of the woods, and I get a lot of people sending me text and telling me I should be more interested in the closure of Marsden Point. But it does strike me whether or not that particular plant is the answer. Whangarei needs something. It needs four lanes up and down from Auckland, or it needs something to unlock the vast potential of that part of the country. Do you have a plan for that? We certainly do. The main road goes over... Uh, it, it goes over a hill called the Brent Derwins. That hill is uh, partly rock, but it's the sort of rock that if you stop to have a pee, it crumbles, or it's clay. And what needs to be happening is a massive road through the middle, built on massive pylons like they do in Europe. This this idea that you can tunnel through the Brent Derwins hill to Lake Whangarei, we need a massive road through the middle, built on pylons, as yep. we see overseas in Europe. Mm -hmm. And if there's Hoshetta's frog or some rear bat, <laughs> then get them out, then make a bloody flax kit, gather them up and put them at the back, take them down the back of Murupara or the back of Dargan or somewhere. We're not going to have this almost religious level of zeal defending these tiny little creatures when five million New Zealanders in particular, two and a half percent of that population where I come from, we're less important than the shit frog. Than the shit frog. Now nah, yeah. those, those days are over, buddy. Yeah. Hey Shane, look once again, thank you for your hospitality over the weekend. It was one of the most enjoyable Waitangi weekend do's I've ever been to in my life. Um, and thank you for coming on this morning. Kia ora. Bye bye, folks. Cheers, Shane Jones, New Zealand first world candidate. Candidate. Um, they are back in business. Uh, I'm just telling you from that interview, they are back in business. And a lot of you saying thank you, you've cleared a few things up. And I, I think we've got a definitive difference in policy and approach um, though with, uh, between ACT and New Zealand First. But interesting enough, also quite a lot of common ground there. But boy, uh, he's, saying, he's saying they're not buying into this rubbish from the Human Rights Commission and if New Zealand First is... Anyone where near government, Paul Hunt is out of a job after the next election. I'm really interested in your reaction to that interview. I found it fascinating. Mind you, I did it. I have to, don't 